Blaster Master is a multi-genre game released by Sunsoft for the NES in 1988. Gameplay includes driving a tank that can not only shoot but also jump, navigate a world, defeat enemies, and stumble upon small doorways that your tank cannot access. Press the select button and now you're out of the tank and on foot. The game has changed. Now those doorways can be entered and yet another mode of gameplay appears. Navigate this dungeon-like environment, find and defeat the boss, and obtain an upgrade for your tank like the hyper beam seen here. Upgrades help reach new areas. That hyper beam lets me destroy this guardian that blocks the way to area 2, for example. The pause menu shows the items acquired. Two items worth noting are the wall 1 and wall 2 power-ups listed on the right side of the screen. Wall 1 lets the tank move up and down walls. Wall 2 allows it to hang from the ceiling. No extra input is required from the player, and the transitions are seamless. Simply holding right on the D-pad causes the tank to travel in four different directions, rotate around a platform, and have many unique frames of animation. How does the game handle this? Let's pop the hood and find out. We'll start by talking about objects. Each object in the game has an ID, pretty standard stuff. The object ID allows the game to know which logic to use to process movement, collision detection, and more for the associated object. At the start of the game, we have the player with an object ID of 3 and this enemy with an object ID of 97. When you see the enemy start jumping, that's because its ID has been changed to 96. Simply changing the object ID tells the game to use a different set of movement for this enemy's AI. If I change the object ID for the player from 3 to 96 in RAM, we now have two enemies just hanging out together. Alternatively, I can change the tank object ID of 3 to 27, and now we're in walkabout mode. Change it back to 3, and we are in the tank again. Just as both of these are player objects but with different IDs and therefore a different appearance and behavior, the same is true for the various orientations of the tank relative to the terrain. Each tank is literally a different object, as far as the game is concerned. So if it's just a matter of changing the player ID depending on where the tank is on the block, how is that done? With the player object ID currently at 3, an upright tank, the logic is constantly checking to see if the wall 1 and wall 2 power-ups have been acquired, even if the tank isn't in motion. The order of the rotation criteria is Check the current location of the tank to see if wall 1 and wall 2 criteria apply. If so, see if the tank has those abilities. Find out if the player's location has reached the appropriate checkpoint on the current tile. The checkpoints on each side of a tile are used to determine if we've reached an edge. If the tank reached the checkpoint, see if the player is still pressing right. If so, check the attributes for the upcoming tile. If the tile's in the background, then we have reached an edge. Begin rotation transition. That's the rough criteria. Makes sense. Multiple steps, but fairly straightforward. Now this entire example is in a segment of code that is responsible for handling left and right D-pad presses while the player is inside the tank and the tank is upright. As soon as the tank needs to begin the rotation at this right corner, the object ID changes. And this brings us to a primary pivot point in the code that is executed many, many times during the game. This is Hydra. At least, that's what I elected to call it. This statement uses a pointer to determine where on earth we are headed Next in the code. Two bytes, 7a and 7b, contain the destination address. The game updates these destination bytes elsewhere in code, and the values specified for them are looked up based on the current object ID for player, enemy, projectile, anything. Here is a selection of various addresses stored in 7a and 7b prior to reaching this code along with what they do. Now there is additional logic that uses the pointer addresses at other locations, but this should give you a handful of proper examples. Code doesn't have to concern itself with a giant conditional statement multiple times per frame since the destination at this instruction is dynamic. The logic can arrive here to process any given object. When the player ID is 3, the destination is 92DE. The code that follows that address checks the various tank rotation criteria that we just covered. Since our tank has begun to rotate to the right side of the tile, the object ID has changed. That means Hydra's destination for player movement has also changed. It now jumps to this horizontal to vertical rotation address. The rotations around the corner of a tile are special cases. Let's set those aside for now and check the difference in movement logic for the tank being on the top, right, bottom, or left side of a tile. 
When the player ID is 3 and normal movement is used, right D-pad presses increase horizontal velocity toward a maximum of positive 24, and left D-pad presses decrease horizontal velocity toward a minimum of negative 24. Simple enough. Positive or negative indicate direction. The number itself indicates speed. When on the right side of a tile, right means down and left means up. How is this done? It's a simple case of data substitution. Copy the vertical velocity and shove it into the place of the horizontal velocity before calling the same old function for acceleration, speed limits, and input handling. The number is crunched as usual, and the result is copied from horizontal velocity back to vertical velocity. The same function handles both this and this with the second example using a sneaky substitution before and after the function call for right side vertical travel. When the tank is underneath the tile, it just negates the horizontal acceleration before calling the acceleration function in order to reverse the controls. Finally, when the tank is on the left side of the tile, it does a combination of the substitution and reversal. With the updated acceleration value in the proper place, movement processing graphics and more can take it from here. Obviously more happens than just this code for each of the four sides, but this shows how just a simple value tweak before a standard subroutine can let the same code handle input and acceleration regardless of the tank's orientation. Now what about rotation at the corners though, those special cases I mentioned? Whereas player input can affect acceleration while on any of the four sides of a tile, the rotation around the corner is automatic. The tank is put on a conveyor belt of sorts for a few frames. Our only concern with player input at this time has to do with if they let go of their D-pad press during rotation. If so, the tank falls off the tile. An index is maintained so we know which frame we are on in the rotation sequence. This frame index is important as it is not only used for the graphics, but is also used to look up the velocities in order to position those tank graphics for the frame. That same lookup table contains the object ID for the next tank orientation when we reach the right side of the tile, as well as the arrival velocity for both axes once rotation is complete. So increase the frame index, look up the next velocities, and proceed to move the tank around the corner. Seems simple enough, at least for the numbers game. What about the graphics though? The tank is assembled using six 8x8 sprites, three for the turret, one for the body, and two for each of the wheels. Each of these six sprites has its corresponding tiles swapped out depending on the current orientation of the tank. Let's call those graphical orientations 0 degrees, 45 degrees, and 90 degrees. Additional angles are achieved by flipping the sprites over the horizontal and vertical axes as needed. Keen observers will note that there are additional unique tank frames beyond these three angles. Since Blaster Master uses 8x8 sprites to build the tank, it can relocate those sprites relative to each other in order to create some of the finer movements. Examples include something simple, like the tank bouncing on its suspension as it moves across the terrain. Or even something a bit fancier, like when the tank jumps. The wheels appear to push down into the ground prior to a jump and hang down as the vehicle moves upward. Once gravity stops upward momentum, the wheelbase continues upward a few pixels and compresses the suspension. A simple relocation of two wheel sprites helps create a feeling of physics at work. The tank even bounces just a bit when it hits the ground. Not including the bookend frames that match 0 and 90 degree orientation, there are only 7 unique frames shown during the transition. Video output is updating at close to 60 frames per second, which means we only see the rotation frames for just over a tenth of a second, roughly 120 milliseconds. The average speed of a human eye blink is about 400 milliseconds. That's a lot of detail to put into something that you could literally blink and miss. That said, the resulting animation is quite smooth, especially at the wheelbase. That's a lot of attention to detail on something, and I find it to be rather impressive. One other side note. I experimented with the design of the controls a little bit and removed the automatic use of wall 1 when moving from normal orientation to vertical. Players can navigate the level and drop off the platforms just as things were prior to acquiring the wall 1 power-up. To rotate around the platform, hold the B button down while moving left or right. Once the tank is rotated to the side or underneath the platform, release B. The tank can fire downward and move back and forth as normal. If you've played the game before, it's possible this change is helpful. However, for new players, this sort of complex custom control scheme modification is not intuitive at all.
If we ported Blaster Master to the Super Nintendo, we could probably make use of additional buttons on the controller to toggle the abilities on or off. Speaking of controls, it's time to look at another form of gameplay. In overhead mode, players use the B button to fire their gun, which can have 8 additional levels of power. The A button throws grenades. We just talked about intuitiveness of controls, and one semi-hidden feature of Blaster Master is the ability to strafe. Press and hold the A button and D-pad presses will allow the player to move while continuing to face the same direction. Release the A button to resume normal turning. Strafing can be useful when fighting bosses as it allows for continuous fire without constant course corrections. You may find the need to hold the controller in a different manner so you can manage holding A while also pressing B repeatedly. An NES advantage would help with this. Speaking of fighting bosses, one of the well-known exploits in Blaster Master is to throw a grenade and then pause the game during a boss battle. Even though the game is paused, damage continues to be dealt to the boss. It doesn't work on every boss in the game, just a few of them. This is the boss in Area 2. I've added its health to the screen. Throw a grenade, pause the game, and watch the health decrease. Unpause. Dead. Why does this happen? What is the bug? Our rotation logic introduced us to Hydra, a single line of code that can jump to any specified address from a lookup based on an object's ID. Just above Hydra is a section of code that adds three bytes to the destination address for the Hydra jump if the game is not paused. So a code jump for player movement, for example, is going to happen regardless of if the game is paused or not. Since object processing is compartmentalized, we can use a Game Genie to force an object to always be unpaused. For example, if I add an exemption to the player movement code so it jumps to the same place and then I pause the game, I can still move around. Animation frames are broken, but controller input is handled. Let's examine a specific code destination from Hydra. When fighting the Area 1 boss, Hydra jumps to A58C for boss handling when not paused and A589 when it is paused. C processes boss movement, collision detection, and more. 9 returns from subroutine and doesn't do any other work. They even padded the area between the two destinations with two no-operation opcodes. These two opcodes should never be reached. There are only two objects on this screen right now, the player and the boss. You'll notice that whenever I pause the game, the objects that orbit the boss disappear. They don't have their own ID and therefore their own handling logic. Their constant movement or location work is most likely done from inside Boss 1's routine. A routine that we just saw is completely skipped when the game is paused. That is why the objects do not appear. When fighting the boss of Area 2, Hydra uses a different code destination for boss movement because it's a different object ID. The arms are processed inside the function, but they still appear when the game is paused. The reason for this is because the pause destination for this object's handler function is a bit fancier than the simple don't do anything get out that was performed in the Area 1 boss example. Additional object IDs for the projectiles are also processed and have their own logic as expected. So if you ever wondered why the pause trick only works on certain bosses, it's because the logic used between any two bosses might be apples to oranges, as different objects are likely tied to different code destinations. The object handler freezes boss movement, but continues to provide location info for the arms as well as deal damage from the grenade as collision detection is not skipped. If we modify that section of code at the pause destination for this boss to mimic the first boss's approach of just getting out of the function, the grenade no longer does damage. A side effect, of course, is that the arms also disappear. This same change also prevents the game from constantly dealing damage to the player when paused during collision with the boss. This patch is an all-or-nothing approach to the object handler function. Can we isolate the problem inside the function and provide a better solution? There is code inside the function just before collision detection for both player and enemy that checks a flag to see if we should bail out of the function and skip collision detection. The flag comes from address 3FD. Pause uses RAM location 15 hex. How do we find out what 3FD does? Well, we'll just watch it. Oh, right. There's a countdown that occurs as the boss fades in. During this time, you can't take damage from or deal damage to the boss. 
So there are at least two flags to check for bypassing damage, one for the timer and a second for a paused game. This code for this boss only checks the timer. Therefore, the damage skip for a paused game does not exist. And because of that, we have the iconic pause trick of Blaster Master. Ironically, there is a subroutine called while inside this same boss handling, but prior to collision detection, that does check the pause flag along with two others. Something stored in 4F, ORed with the appearance timer, and then ORed again with the pause flag. If any one of these flags is set, this block of code underneath is skipped. So a proper fix would certainly entail checking both the timer and the pause state for a collision detection bypass and perhaps also require checking whatever we have stored at 4F. There isn't enough room to patch it with a Game Genie, but we could substitute a pause state check in place of the timer check in the current code makeup. This prevents the player from damaging the boss as well as the boss from damaging the player during a paused state. It also keeps the arms intact during a pause. Of course, that also means you now harm each other before the timer expires at the start of battle. So many things to talk about with Blaster Master. I hope you enjoyed this particular selection of topics. For more videos like this one, please like the video and subscribe. I also have a Patreon available, and I hope you return to watch more videos in the future. There are certainly plenty of games to cover. Until next time, thanks for watching.